so where to start? Well, I'm going to start by saying a little bit about where resilience fits into the work of the ULEX project. And I'll do that by uh, sharing with you a framework that we use for designing our program. You know, mostly what we do is we run trainings uh, helping to build capacity within social movements. So what's that mean? Well, look, here's a, here's a diagram. It might give us a way into that. I'll share this with you on my screen. Uh -huh. So hopefully you can see that. Maybe someone give me a thumbs up or something if you can. Yeah, great. Thanks, Gita. Thanks. Well, thanks everyone. So okay. So here we go. This 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 slide um, shows uh, how we think about capacity building for social movements. Basically, we use a framework thinking about what are some of the key capabilities that social movements need in order to be effective. So we work with five of these. Um, the first one here is narrative. So a narrative uh, capability, the ability for our movements to sort of tell the story of what's going on. Um, you know, how did we get here? Uh, the story, uh, the, the vision, as it were, of like, where could we go to? How could things be different? What would need to happen for those changes to happen? And importantly as well, in this sort of narrative uh, capability is the idea of like, who are we? You know, in building movements, a really important part of this is the kind of the building a sense of the we that constitute those movements. So the narrative cap capability. Second capability is the uh, disruptive capacity or capability, which is, you know, you could think about this as maybe one of the obvious forms of all the different kinds of civil disobedience uh, that movements might be involved in, but lots of other things as well. It's the ways that our movements help to open up space for change. Uh, it's the ways that we build um, increase our, our, our leverage in the situation. It's ways in which we sort of say no to the sort of the day-to-day -day functioning of the status quo of the system uh, that we're in. So disruptive capability. The third one is an institutional capability, um, which is so important as a way of translating our stories and leveraging disruption to make real structural change. Um, I think one way of getting a sense of this is if uh, you think back maybe to something like uh, one recent historical example might be the Occupy movement. The Occupy movement yeah, had a disruptive capability, you know, the occupying of spaces, you know, generating a lot of attention through that kind of stuff. And it had a very strong narrative capability. One of the, one of the most important legacies of Occupy was this stuff about, you know, the 1% and the 99%, you know, a really easy way to kind of like bring clarity to the levels of inequality. Uh, within our society. So really strong in that sense, but really lacked a capacity to translate that into institutional change. Although, you know, historically we might say that maybe that's something that's happening now. Other people pick that up. And thinking about these capabilities is, is very useful in recognizing the different kinds of roles that there are within our movements. You know, some parts of our movements do narrative and disruption very well. Other parts of our movements are needed for this institutional kind of transformation. So institutional capability, changing structures, implementing vision, transforming power relationships. These three uh, uh, are, are, you know, often sort of referred to. I first came across them in a, a book um, by a, an activist uh, called Zainep Tufekci, and the book is called Twitter and Tear Gas. And she had done a lot of research looking at um, the phenomenon of the Arab Spring, um, the, the kind of uprising the, the, in, uh, in Turkey as well. And uh, so these three are kind of quite common. The next two are the ones that at ULEX we add to that as well, which aren't often given as much attention. So the fourth one is uh, prefigurative capability. I mean, prefigurative is a, is a sort of a, a fancy term for walking the talk. Right? It's about how do we, within our movements, embody our values? How do we model the kind of new social relations that we're trying to, that we're struggling to, to, to produce in the world? You know, it's not just about creating that in the future, but how do we do it now? How do we em embody that within the way that we struggle together? So prefigurative capability. And then the fifth one, resilience. You know, it's like 
if we're a threat, we are going to be under attack. Right? You know, we're going to be attacked by the state. We're going to be attacked by non-state actors. Actually, the way the system is set up, in a certain sense, attacks many of us in different ways. It's just, you know, it's basically structured in a way that it suppresses and represses our capacity to change things. So resilience is key in weathering repression and suppression. It's like we need it to kind of keep going to avoid, you know, to deal with the burnout and the disillusionment and the cynicism that can arise in long-term struggles where we kind of hemorrhage talent. And it's also part of the nourishing our roots. You know, how do we stay nourished? How, how, do, we, how, how do we do that? So this area of resilience. So focusing on that, here's another slide for you. Here we go. This is one of the ways we think about um, building resilience in movement. So we talk about strategies for psychosocial resilience. And the, the term psychosocial is supposed to kind of emphasize that this isn't just about like individual qualities, it's also about communities, also about organizations. And we, we are quite sort of clear in trying to bring attention to three dimensions of resilience, psychosocial resilience. So the individual and the personal, you know, what goes on in our emotional lives, what happens within our own mental states, what happens with our own health and our, our well-being. And there are strategies at that level. As individuals in our struggles, we operate within organizations, within groups. And so we need to build strategies for resilience within our groups, within our organizations. This is like the interpersonal dimension. And our organizations and groups, they sit within a bigger ecology of our movements, you know, so the socio-political movement dimension of resilience. How do we navigate the relationships across our movements? How do we build um, relationships and connections between different parts of our movements that, that support resilience? Okay, I'm going to drop the screen, I think, now. Okay, so, so today the idea is we're going to talk with five people, right, who do really interesting work um, on, on, in areas related to the intersection of these different dimensions of psychosocial resilience, you know, the inner and the outer, the psychological and the political the political and the ecological, and uh, and see you know what, what we what we can learn through through this kind of conversation. And I'm going to start by um, chatting with uh, Anthea, and uh, Anthea has a background in a quite a long a long um, sort of career engagement in activism of different sorts, a lot of human rights work, working with with organisations like Amnesty, Global Witness arms trade work and so on and uh, in recent years took a bit of a step back from that to reflect more deeply on questions about how does the inner inform our outer engagement and so on so so Anthea um, hello and I'm going to kind of ask you ask you a little bit about the journey that took you to this pause this kind of period of stepping back that you've been sort of engaged in recently so Okay, thank you very much. Hello, and thanks for inviting me along. Um, yes, so about four years ago, I stepped back from the form of activism that I had been doing. I originally trained as a journalist. I was a newspaper reporter. I thought I was going to change the world that way. I soon realised that wasn't quite going to work out as I'd imagined. Um, and I moved into working for NGOs. I spent five years working for controls on the arms trade. I worked on the campaign that Oxfam and Amnesty did uh, for the arms trade treaty. When I was working at Amnesty, I worked for an organization, a, a coalition of 700 gun control organizations around the world, trying to persuade the UN to control the small arms trade. Um, and then I moved to working on economic justice issues, specifically uh, the, the, the resource curse, the tendency of countries which are very wealthy in natural resources, that's assuming we're framing them like that just for a moment, um, like oil and diamonds and timber to end up with very high levels of conflict and poverty. And so I started up campaigns looking at the role of banks and tax havens in creating poverty, effectively, by facilitating corruption and massive, massive transfers of wealth from these countries straight into the City of London and other financial centres. And I did this for a long time and some of it was successful. We didn't have much of a go at the banks, they're still accepting corrupt money. Um, 
I st helped start up a campaign that uh, noticed the the way that people could hide corrupt money by setting up companies and hiding their ownership of them. So we launched a campaign saying, if you set up a company, you've got to say who it is. Um, and, that, and it all just took off. It really took off. Lots of other organisations joined in. Uh, somehow we managed to persuade several governments and now 79 countries uh, at the latest count have done it. Um, so that should have been successful and I should have been feeling quite good and of course I was. Um, but I was also feeling like I was running into a wall and, and there were several feelings in that. One was this pervasive sense that in many ways we were replicating aspects of the system that we were trying to change. Um, we were operating according to various rational actor assumptions that, of course, underpin the economics we were trying to influence. Um, we weren't treating everybody brilliantly within uh, the organisations that we were working in. Um, I was also having this very strong realisation that was coming from spending my weekends climbing mountains and jumping in rivers and trying to sort of balance up the stress of what I was doing with some greenery. I, I was realising the depth um, of our connection, connection with the non-human world and, and becoming really troubled by the fact that even if I fill, fulfilled every single detail on these um, incredibly detailed log frames that we had to fit, fill out for our funders saying exactly what we were going to do and exactly what our objectives were and exactly how we were going to show we had done it. I could, I could, I could do all of that and we still would be doing ourselves out of a planet that we can live on. Um, and that dissonance just became too great. I was also becoming tired of, tired of the demonising, um, tired of the extent to which we were, we were chasing these people um, and saying, yes, yes, um, you're the problem. This is what we need. To, this is what you need to do. And of course, yes, what they were doing was a problem. Um, but there was something in the way that, the way that I was doing it, um, that became very troubling. And so, and so I stepped back from what I was doing. Um, and there were personal reasons for that as well. And I started thinking about um, this question of what the inner life of activism, because it felt like something was missing. It felt like we were so uh, we were so busy being practical and strategic and tactical about the practical details of what, what needed changing that we were missing something. Um, and so I embarked with an organisation I'm working with at the moment called Perspectiva, which is quite new and has been set up to look at the links between the our inner worlds and the outer world. Uh, I embarked on a fairly ill-defined inquiry into the inner life of activism. Um, and I didn't try and define it myself. I just wanted, I suppose to start with, I wanted to, I wanted to know if I was going mad. Am, am I the only person thinking this? What's going on here? And I started talking to other activists and I wasn't going mad. Um, I found lots of people who from very different perspectives were sort of saying the same thing. And so slowly that has turned into a book called The Entangled Activist, which I've almost so, watched. Yeah, so, so, I mean, I was lucky enough to see sort of a sneak preview of your latest draft of the book, which looks really fascinating, like The Entangled Activist. What's the, what, are, what are the sort of some of the key themes that you're, you're kind of addressing there? What are, you, what are you wanting to really share with people? Well, ultimately, but it's time, well, it's time to, it's always been time, but it's about recognising the extent and the depth to which we are part of what we're trying to change. Now, there's this casual expression that gets used when you start being a campaigner and people say, oh, you're off to change the world. That was the sort of thing my mum would say to me. Um, and, you know, OK, this is trite and it's silly in a way, but I think that the grammar of that sentence is very interesting and it reveals something extremely deep um, about the way that the world, as we perceive it, is over there and we are over here and we're going to do something about it over there. Now, that sounds a bit abstract, doesn't it? So a specific example is some of my colleagues and I, not everyone, uh, we would talk about getting the bastards. Now that's, so that's a framing that really says you're over there. And yes, OK, sometimes they arguably were. We're talking about offshore tax lawyers um, and kleptocrats, bagmen and bankers and, and oil company executives and all these people who are doing these things that we were publishing reports about. Um, but I've thought about that a lot since I've been thinking about it. Now, what kind of what shifts if we if we do acknowledge that we're part of what we're trying to change? I think something shifts in how we go about doing activism. And I think something also potentially shifts in what it is we see needs doing in the world. So so on the how, if we acknowledge that the problems run through us, 
and and that they're as much in us as anyone else, then we're less likely to do that polarizing it's you over there thing. I think it changes how we engage. Um, it raises the possibility of having more effective conversations and in situations where conversations are not going to be happening and we're resisting, then I think it can help us find the love and the compassion that are the necessary counterweight to anger and commitment in coming together to form nonviolent resistance. And of course the nature of how the problems run through us depends on where we're starting from. There are differences between uh, being involved in campaigning with lived, lived experience of an issue um, and being involved in campaigning because you can see there's a problem and you'd really want to help. And of course, there's no simple binary on that either because we're all affected in different ways. Another how that comes up is how we're operating in our organisations. Um, and you've just referred to this, G, this question of prefiguration. Now, if we recognise that cultures of relentless doing and action and activity, if they run through us as well as the uh, endless growth economy that we're trying to do something about, then we can start to understand the deep roots of burnout a bit more. If we recognise that the habits of, of dominance that we criticise in the people we want to change also run very deep in us, then we can start to see how we can end up enacting them even without realising with other campaigners we're working with and perhaps particularly with the people that we're trying to help. And, and if we recognise that... Um, the dominant culture of individualism um, that we're in centres us as the subject and everyone else, everything else as the object, and this thinking goes hundreds of years deep in, in the thinking of modernity, then it starts to show us how, how we can become attached to ideas of progress that have us at the centre of them as the person making it happen. And if we're in that place, then it's very hard to do the thing that makes activism more sustainable, which is seeing it as a practice, something that we do even if we're not getting results, uh, and we can just keep at it. And if we can see the extent of this problem running through us, our sense of what it is that needs to change broadens. Of course the policies and the rules need fixing, of course they do, but we start to see that the root of bad policies and bad politics is in how humans relate to each other. And on this basis, altering our perception to recognise in our interconnectedness with everyone and everything else can become quite a radical move. And of course, it's not new to be saying any of this. People have been saying this forever. But goodness, it keeps coming up. It comes up with every generation of activists. So what I'm trying to do in this book is reflect on the practical examples from my own experience, but in the light of what I've realised uh, since taking a, a temporary breather from it um, about the extent to which we're entangled. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing seeing the book in its sort of final form. You know, having had that, had that sneak preview, because you know it covers it covers stuff at the Ulex we've been exploring for some years. And in that process, you know, activists step in, need to find the space to step back, need to find the the, the opportunities for deeper reflection, to recognise, as you say, the way that we reproduce the problems in the way that we do our activism and so on. One of the risks that we've seen in that is this risk of kind of pathologising our activism in that process. Process, a bit like it hurts, right? When we recognise how we're doing that in our own, in our own lives, it kind of hurts. And I think sometimes people get burnt by that and almost then kind of react against their activism and sort of pathologise it. Do you see that as a risk? And, I mean, how, would you, how, how do we avoid that if we can? I think it is a risk, and this is really important, isn't it? Because we're getting so much criticism from outside already, um, I think this is one of the reasons that I paused for so long before doing this, because I'd thought about it for a long time. I, you know, I'd see these problems in activism and think, well, we can't say anything. It feels somehow disloyal um, to me. And, and why would we give our opponents ammunition? You know, why would we give them yet another opportunity to bypass the content of what we're saying um, and agree with us that we think we're being a bit annoying? Because, you know, what is it that pe I've, I went out and asked people, you know, what is it that is difficult about activists? Um, and the same words kept coming up, righteous, hypocritical, shouty, um, totalitarian is, is, is the worst of it from, from, from people on the conservative side who, who, who worry about that. And, and when these accusations are being made about our, our psychology, it can feel, I think, like a political failure to pay attention to the same material. Um, and of course, it's true. It's not just about our psychology. Um, but I think we can, we can approach this without... Um, saying it's just about our psychology and, and we're going to go down this route of saying everything we're doing is terrible and also avoiding the extreme of saying well we just need to stick with the political and the material explanations of what's going on.
because to be resistant to looking at our inner lives, um, I think is to, to reinforce once again, this, this duality, this binary opposition that the dominant culture sets up between the inner and the outer. Um, I think it's possible to look at our inner lives together with looking at power. And, and it can be a means of, of resisting power, um, not submitting to it, to look at how it runs through us and, and can make us its agent. It might make us better activists. And, and in doing that, is, is there something that we can do that helps us not to, I suppose, kind of, you know, re reproduce very sort of self-referential, self-preoccupied, self-absorbed ways of kind of practice, which seem, you know, which seem quite, um, well, real pitfalls of kind of spiritual and therapeutic and psychological work. How, how might we avoid that? Because I think as activists, people often feel a resistance to doing that inner work because they think they might, you know, just be drawn back into that kind of extreme in a way. Right. And it is a risk mm. and we see it happening. I mean, that's the great criticism of, of the great flowering that happened in the 60s, isn't it? Um, that, you know, they all went off to Esalen and then didn't come back um, to get on with the work. Um, and this is an entanglement in, in, again, in the individualism that helps, that helps to frame us. Um, and they can seem separate poles, but again, this is about the way that um, our culture presents them as, as separate. I think it is possible to look at the inner um, without making it instrumental that we're only doing it in order to improve our activism. Um, but actually, if we can try and hold them both, it can make our activism better. And also, it goes the other way. If we're doing activism in, in a more aware way, in a more conscious way, um, I'm nervous about using that word, but, but with a bit of awareness of what's going on, it can provide, it can provide data to, and information that we can feed back into the work that we're doing um, in our inner lives. And I learned something interesting from working with Sophie Banks, who, who set up the, um, the inner transition component of the transition network. Um, and she sees this in a sort of systems thinking way, which is that there's a, there's a feedback loop. And so if we recognize that what is going on within us is, is a reflection of what's going on in the outside world, then noticing um, the unhealthy cultures that we can sometimes generate in activism or the unhealthy patterns that we can get to in ourselves is a feedback loop of seeing what's going on. It can help us uh, point in the right direction for, for where our work's going um, and how we're doing out there in the world and what the task is in the world. Yeah. So, so we'll, get, we'll, we'll get to hear a bit more from you when we come, come back around to these questions and things. When, when's the book going to be out, by the way, and, and where? Where are we going to get to see this thing? Um, so it's being published by a new small press called Perspectiva Press, and I don't know how long it's going to take because I don't know what um, finishing a book um, in lockdown involves. And my editor <laughs> has it at the moment. So let's, mm. say, let's say this year, um, and I'm sorry I can't give any more detail. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Cool. Okay, thanks. So, so going to sort of turn to have a have a um, sort of bring Dean and Aisha in, into into the conversation. And I mean, I was uh, I was really excited to meet both of you recently just through Zoom, right? But it was like really brilliant because you know we've been, as I said, you know, with ULEC sort of working on this sort of um, interface of inner and outer type work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And using mindfulness as well. We run we run a training called you know mindfulness for social change. <laughs> And I think talking with the two of you, I'm not sure I'd found anybody who kind of was articulating the stuff you're articulating as well as you are. And you kind of at one point said something like, we're, you know, what, what we're doing with our work is we're trying to help people to become courageous individuals who can be able to bring awareness to all areas of their experience and sort of mental states, their emotional lives, the interpersonal and socio-political, something like that, right? You know, forgive me if I'm misquoting you, right? But yeah, I mean, it's like really, I just think it's really exciting, like a really brilliant project, the um, Urban Mindfulness Foundation. And the, the other, the, the, one of the things you do is something you call mindfulness-based inclusion training. What's that all about? I mean, give us, give us, a, give us, a, give us a flavor. Yeah. Hey, thanks, G. Um, it's, um, yeah, that's a big question. But I, I guess, you know, um, our journey really uh, uh, starts, or, or certainly my journey starts from, from being an environmental scientist. And, and, um, and maybe even before that, I should say, you know, growing up in East London, a uh, real um, area of death, deprivation i don't know if many of you know but a, a, a sort of borough called hackney which was you know sort of 40 years ago was a was a was a tough place to grow up in 
So, you know, my journey really started with a, a real discontent with my environment and seeing the environment that I came from and what, you know, how the environment was perpetuating some of the problems that I was seeing. So I got, I, I, I sort of developed a bit of a bee in my bonnet about, you know, um, the urban environment and, and, and sort of creating green spaces at the time. Like, you know, that was my thing was to create green spaces and, and yeah, so I went through the educational system, did my first degree in that and really found that actually, um, whilst I was a, 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 became a, a relatively successful environmental consultant, there was not much changing for, for the places that I was really concerned about. So there was a bit of, um, uh, uh, you know, I guess maybe a lack of um, hope, really, that, that things could change. So, but I was coming from a space of very, you know, person-centered, the environment out there, didn't really look at what was going on in here, actually. And, you know, I think it was about 2000 and maybe eight, nine, I started to realize and, and look into self. What was going on here? Because I couldn't change the world. I realized that. I, I, felt like I, I felt like I couldn't. I felt like I had no um, agency. So I really started to look into uh, oneself through the uh, sort of window of mindfulness training and practice. And what I found there actually was more self stuff, you know, more looking at oh, building resilience in the self, um, building a sense of groundedness and stability within self. And, and then even down the spiritual route, it was a lot about self-liberation, you know, the scary word of things like enlightenment and all that stuff. And like, whoa, you know, my, my issue was like, or my view was there was more to this than me, you know, more than this to this than what was just going on here. Um, so as we've been embarked on all these formal training sessions and so forth, it just didn't sit right. So we, 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 we just started to question and we started right at the beginning as what are we doing here? What is mindfulness? Um, and it took us to study at MS, uh, MSC level and we realized, you know, there's, there's, there's hundreds of definitions of what mindfulness is, you know? Um, so we really looked at focusing on what is it we're doing? What is this about? And I think, you know, sort of taking in your, the previous speaker, we really realized that this was about relationship, relational, you know? So we developed a, a program which was mindfulness-based inclusion. One of the things that we suffered with or struggled with was talking about our social and systemic problems in a mindfulness classroom. And it was like, oh, well, that's your stuff, you know? And, and um, you know, maybe if you practice a little bit more, you, you'll, you'll, you'll get over those stuff, that, that sort of systemic social thing. And it just wasn't washing. Um, and actually, we practiced a lot with ourselves and, 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 and on ourselves. Resilience. But then it was clear that again wasn't enough because hey we're just writing and trying to connect with Dean and Aisha now to see if we can get a stronger connection please just bear with us for a second We seem to have got cut off. Sorry. Are we back? Can you hear us? You, you are, you are back. Yeah, I thought it was okay. me, but it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, you, are, you are back. Cool. Great stuff. So, um, I think in the end, what where what where we where we came to is that this is there's more to to this than than self liberation. 
You know, there's more to this. Uh, and there's no point in being well in ourselves and walking past fellow, you know, our, our fellow kin and they're really struggling and they're, they're getting hit by so social and systemic issues. So I think I was, what I was actually saying was people talk about increasing this glass so you can hold the stresses and strains of life more. And I kept saying to my teachers, you know, what happens when you've got a real big vase, you can hold all the stress, but then outside you just keep getting knocked. You know, people keep pulling you down a rabbit hole of, you know, and my particular issue was identity, you know. Um, I've struggled a lot with um, racism and, and racial, have had racial attacks and so forth. And I'm like, oh, oh, this is not good enough, you know. There's more to, to, to our mindfulness practice than self-liberation. So that's where it really started, I think. Um, and, and, that, and that sort of brought you to kind of like mm, using, using a kind of your own sort of definition of mindfulness, the way you mentioned there are lots, and you've got a particular way of uh, defining that, right, in the work you do? Yeah, we have. And, I, I mean, what we say is, for us, mindfulness is about knowing how you're relating whilst you're relating to everyone and everything. And what that does is really bring us into a space where whatever we're doing, whatever we're connecting, whoever we're connecting with, whether we're at work, in a, you know, in, in um, interpersonal, even when we're looking into ourselves, how are we relating to ourselves? How are we rela relating to others, the systems that we swim in or, you know, um, so that's that's really the definition. How are we relating whilst we're relating to everyone and everything? And that really brings in that compassion side of the practice for, for us. It really brings in the heart of the practice. And what we found was that, you know, it's particularly with the medicalized versions of mindfulness, it was like, you know, let's not go down the compassion route. Let's avoid that conversation about the social and systemic issues. Uh, just focus on the breath and you'll be okay, you know? Um, and that was a real problem, I guess. So coming up with that definition, making it relational was, was key. Because there's the compassion side to that, but there's also I mean, the other thing that I think you said to me the other day, actually I think it was you were saying that your work combines this idea of wise attention, which you get in mind from us, with critical thinking. And I guess when we start bringing awareness to a relationship in a way it involves a certain kind of critical a, a critical approach to understand and unpick what's really going on in these relationships and and with that you also were saying something about um problematizing in mindfulness this idea of non-judgment and acceptance can you tell us a bit about a bit about that yeah um so it's it's really interesting because like Dean mentioned there's so many different um definitions of mindfulness but a, a lot of them um, they touch around, you know, avoiding judgment or avoiding preference. As human beings, I don't know if anyone, anyone else out there um, can relate, but we tend to do that. We tend to judge. We tend to have a preference. You know, that's, that's part of our agency. It's a part of, you know, noticing if there's an issue. It's a part of our survival. So this idea of looking at, you know, what, what are we judging? What is our preference? Where does it come from? So we start to be interested, we start to be curious, and this is how we can be more connected. When there's a sense of um, judgment and, and preference, there's also a telling that we either are separating or we are connecting. And it's about noticing those boundaries. You know, there's, there's um, a, a teacher out there called Tara Brack, some of you may know of her, she's an excellent mindfulness teacher. And she says, the boundaries to what we're willing to want um, what we are unwilling to accept are the boundaries to our freedom. Now that in itself is massive. So it's about looking at acceptance and also noticing there is a slight difference there with judgment, preference. Accepting doesn't actually mean that we have to necessarily approve. We can accept that things are happening, accept that you know, there's, there's difficulties in the world, but we don't have to approve them. So we can start to be curious about what's happening. A lot of mindfulness, um, you know, we, we go into practice, we're meditating, there's a sense of we've got something wrong if we're thinking. Actually, that's what we do. But start to be curious, where does the mind go? 
if we're ruminating and we get stuck on thoughts, where is the mind taking us? Not that we have to engage it, not that we have to approve it, but actually accept that this is part of us, our being as a human being, and start to look into that, start to see what we're, we're thinking about and be critical about it. You know, what, where does the mind go? What is it telling us? Is it true? Is it real? So we start to really be interested in our own existence. And this is where the wise attention comes in. You know, when we're looking at wise discernment, how we move through into the world, into bringing mindfulness into our everyday living, how we are, we've got to have some kind of wise discernment, not just going with things, you know, willy-nilly. Um, a lot of mindfulness training is about working with emotional intelligence, but we can also have cultural intelligence. We can also have social intelligence. How are we as people? You know, Anthea mentioned earlier about this, this sense of, you know, othering. That's a massive part of what we do. If we're, as, as people, as beings, we are constantly trying to survive. And what we don't really acknowledge so much is how much anxiety we have around other people, especially if there's a sense of difference. But if we are in, in a room knowing that we all struggle, we all suffer somehow, a lot of it is related to our identity and also our ideas. But when we get a sense of distance or separation, it's about being curious about that. Where does it come from? A lot of it is to do with our social conditioning. A lot of it is to do with our socialization. You know, what's fed into us, the, 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 the systems that we live in, the institutions that we're surrounded by. So we start to be really curious about, you know, what, what, what we consume you know, where we learn, how we've grown, those kind of things, and what we continue to do. Do we perpetuate suffering unknowingly? When we get a sense of difference in space, what is that? What's going on there? Can we get a real sense of connection? So for us, mindfulness is really about looking at where we are excluding and seeing if we can include, you know, really start to look at where our own boundaries are so that we can be more in a space of we. You know, we all have different ideas. We all ultimately want to be happy. Some ideas might be a bit warped, but, you know, that's just human nature. That's human nature. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so, and, and how, does, how do you, I mean, like with the, the mindfulness-based inclusion training, what, how do you inquire into this stuff with people? What kind of, what, what sort of process does that involve? It's a really interesting question because what we realized is that, you know, for those of you who do practice mindfulness, there's a typical triangle, you know, and they talk about thoughts, uh, feelings, uh, or, uh, or emotions and bodily sensations. And, you know, what we found was that that is as far as the inquiry tends to go. Uh, and when it gets sort of people go into storytelling or explaining about their life, I'll come back to, you know, the present, what, how does the body feel now? So it's a, a avoidance tactic, really, uh, to go into the real uh, deeper conversation. So we have a, a number of layers underneath that original sort of triangle where we look at habitual patterns as a first step. Then underneath our habit habitual patterns, we look at conditioning. So we really go into quite a bit of our social conditioning. How do we come to know, you know? Um, and then we look at our re relationships, attitudes, and then how that manifests into behavior. So any time we have an inquiry and, and, you know, someone comes up with an experience, we'll ask, okay, so is, is there any habit there? Where might that come from? How do we come to know? So we really look at the epistemological questions. How do we come to know anything? You know, what is it we know or we truly believe in? And then normally what we can find is when we look into that with critical thinking, we observe that it's through our socialization, it's through our education, it's through um, our, our culture that, come, that, that formulates these real certainties. You know, and then we invite a, a sense of practice that allows us to be comfortable in a place of uncertainty, which is also a place of creativity, you know. So really it's about creating, I think, uh, uh, going through these, these levels of inquiry, habitual patterns, conditioning, 
attitudes, relationship and behavior, as well as the triangle. And that really opens up the we. That really opens up how much of what we know is not really our own, um, of our own origination. It's really a, a, a cultural ramshackle. One of our teachers says we're a ramshackle of habitual thoughts, uh, patterns and, and conditioning. And it's a ramshackle of that really that comes to the fore. And then when we realize that we can open up to others. Ah, so that's how we come to know. That's how we come to understand. Uh, and then we can be more curious about others. How do you know? And then, you know, the, the rest sort of does itself really. I think it opens us up to, to, to listening deeply to others that we perhaps wouldn't normally listen to. And, and where we can, where people can kind of get a feel for this, I guess, is it in the trainings you're doing? Is it mostly in, in East London that you're doing that kind of work at the moment? Yeah, that's, so normally we have a, um, a drop-in um, group that, that goes every, every two weeks. So we, we meet up every two weeks in the local community centre. Um, but obviously during lockdown, we've had to put that on hold for a while. Um, so a lot of our uh, sessions have gone online. So for eight weeks during lockdown, we were doing daily sessions um, just to support anyone actually that wanted to connect. It didn't, didn't just have to be our local community, but anyone that wanted to connect. Uh, we've now cut that back a little bit. So every Wednesday and every Saturday we meet up just for an hour in the morning on a Wednesday between eight and nine, and then on a Saturday between 10 and 12. So from the morning to lunchtime, but it, it, it's, it's, it's grown over time. We've also done some work with the um, Mindfulness Association where we've done a few workshops with um, the MSc students that are actually studying with the University of, of Aberdeen. So we've, we've been stretching some of our research that we've been doing and more and more people have become interested. Um, so over time, it depends, you know, whoever's interested. We're, we're kind of happy to collaborate. We're happy to share. We're not kind of this, you know, we're, we're not trying to be a massive um, commercial enterprise by no means. We are about community. We are about connection. And it's not about making money out of this. This is what life is about for us. It's a way into life. And the more that we can share that, whether it's online or in person, that's the way that we'd like to, to take it forward. Brilliant. Nice. Really nice. Good. So, so yeah, like I said, you know, with Anthea as well, we'll come, we'll come back to you both in a bit when people sort of generate some questions and things. I'm going to kind of just bring, bring Jyoti in for a little while as well now. Thank you both. Thanks. And, and so, um, I mean, we're looking, looking at resilience, I think it, we've, we've already spoken, people are talking about, you know, the sort of inner dimension of that. There's been mention of the kind of organisation and the group dimensions. I think Everest will talk more about the kind of, you know, the social movement aspects of that when, when we talk to Everest. But one of the things that we haven't talked about at all is like, you know, really fundamental levels of resilience. I think it's like Vandana Shiva who says something like um, our ecological ident identity is our most fundamental identity. And it's like, you know, our resilience really depends on that sort of ecological base, which, you know, is like whether it's the food, land, use all this kind of stuff and that's that's just the kind of area that you work in uh jyoti you know your your work sort of oh. seems to sort of straddle the relationship between a kind of like you know the, this sort of land-based work and kind of creating resilient sustainable ways of, of food production and stuff and the kind of the social political transformation as well can you can you maybe tell us a bit about what you're doing with the campesina and uh the land workers alliance yeah, yeah, certainly can. And I'm also struggle juggling technology. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, it's the worst part of it. Oh, my God. <laughs> all the rest is fine. Don't worry about that. <laughs> well, as long as we can all laugh about it, it'll be all right. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. No, seriously. Um, but anyway, yeah, what do I do? Um, well, I have a farm in Dorset in south of England, and I it's a mixed agroecological farm. Um, yeah, years ago... Um, my husband and I and my kids decided we just wanted to live on the land and live without um, mains electricity and try and have a low impact lifestyle because that just appealed to us. We wanted to raise our kids on the land and um, yeah, have fresh food for them. I particularly wanted a job where I could uh, have my kids with me when I was working. It, to me, it was a really important aspect of it. So I suppose it, the root of 
my activism sort of came from there. I wanted my, my kids to be with me. Uh, I didn't want to have to send them into daycare or something while I was doing another job. Um, and yeah, just spend time being in connection with the land. So I guess that's the root of what I do. Um, and um, we, I work with the Land Workers Alliance because uh, my husband and I found it a real struggle to get onto the land. We had to get land, which is really expensive to get, and we had no money at all. We were we couldn't even get um, benefits. We had no recourse to public funds, you know, at the time or, or anything. So, um, you know, it, you know, just trying to get past those sort of barriers. Um, uh, he built us a house and. Yeah, all, all of that kind of stuff. I realized, you know, we had to learn the skills by going and volunteering on other people's farms, which a lot of people do. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we, we did all of that. And it made us realize that actually, you know, being, being in connection with land, being on the land is a really important thing if you want to live a sustainable lifestyle um, and kind of practice what you're trying to transform the world to be a bit more like. You have to have the ability to, to do that kind of thing. Um, and... Um, there wasn't that much to support people, other people who wanted to do that. Um, and, and then uh, I kind of worked with other people who were moving back to the land and, and facing the same situation of difficulty of access to land, the difficulty of trying to learn the skills to do it, lots of things going wrong, maybe having to deal with your relationships and your families and the things at the same time. Uh, and spoke to farmers all around the world who are, you know, like indigenous people, peasant farmers, um, you know, anywhere you are in the world, like it's an incredibly important way to live being in connection with the land um, in terms of environmental sustainability and producing food that works with nature, you know, and, and that kind of thing. You know, we've got to really transform the world where a lot more people are able to, to live that way in a dignified way where it's treated with respect. And actually the kind of global system makes it very difficult for people to do that. Um, so in, in the UK, we came together to form the Land Workers Alliance, which is our union for small scale farmers. Many people who are facing similar situations to ourselves and trying to get access to land and farm, or farmers who are finding it difficult to make a living doing what they're doing, um, and kind of connected up with other people around the world through La Via Campesina, which is an international peasant farmers movement. Uh, we represent um, three, it, t no, well, 200 million farmers um, across the world. Uh, so it's a huge movement. It's a huge social movement. Uh, and that can be indigenous people, fisher people, um, you know, migrant workers and peasant farmers um, who are all kind of facing real structural inequalities in having their voices heard to have access to land and water and resources and things. So, um, uh, oh, somebody says, was finding an intentional community to live with something you all think about? Da -da -da -da. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we did live in an intentional community for a while before getting our own farm, for sure. We lived at a place called Tinker's Bubble in South Somerset, which was a fossil fuel free community. Um, there was about 12 uh, different people living there, uh, some with families, um, and we didn't have planning permission. So we had to really challenge the fact that you couldn't live on your land and build your own house without planning permission there. So we, we lived there for a while before we got our own bit of land. And that's also a struggle. I mean, why is it illegal to live a simple life on on the land is <laughs> a bit of a crazy, crazy idea, really. Um, but yeah, somehow the system has made it very difficult to try and escape the rent trap or <laughs> all of that, you know. Um, yeah, so um, now I, I work with the Land Workers Alliance and we've progressed to, to form a social movement to try and make that change based on our own experiences of, of um, what, what we've all faced in various ways that have been difficulties um, in, in trying to achieve what we want to achieve, which is living on the land and producing food. Um, and, and I guess that's the root of a social movement. So social movements can be, you know, they're formed of people um, that have a shared um, common cause, you know, something that, that's affected them in their life and being able to progress in life towards what they want to achieve and come together to fight those injustices but also to provide solidarity to each other so that it's not just um it's not just you know trying to change policy or fighting big trade agreements or you know planning policies or trying to access grants or whatever it is it's also um being there for each other so you should, can share the experiences of the difficulties that you've been through so that you can be a support network for each other also sharing and celebrating um all the joy of it you know how wonderful it is to to 
you know, ha be harvesting your crops um, or, you know, go to a really good Kaylee where everybody's really sweaty and <laughs> dancing together and, you know, just, yeah, just celebrating how fantastic it is. And, uh, you know, agricultural communities were always built around that sense of community, that sense of joy, that sense of celebration after a lot of work. And also, you know, being there to support each other when things go wrong as well. Um, and so, yeah, um, we we really, um, yeah, form that social movement to work on that. And I think being a part of Livia Campesina means that we can multiply our voices so that we have more impact. You know, we can really share and exchange the strategies that we're using across the different countries. You know, between 200 million members, you know, there's a lot of experience there as activists working together where when when we share those ideas or come together to really make massive shifts <laughs> to really like we call it massify agroecology which is this form of farming that we promote um our little actions become bigger than the sum of their parts you know it, it becomes something that can be really transformative and and that's just an incredibly empowering thing to be a part of, of that activism um yeah, uh, I, I don't know. At the moment, I'm doing lots of technical stuff. You know, I've been farming for 20 years, and, my, and now my kids are older, all four of them, after washing four kids with their nappies, I decided, <laughs> and they got older and <laughs> everything else, um, that I would do a little bit more of the political, actual politically faced, you know, institutionally faced work rather than the stuff that was about our own life and how we were going to be transforming our own lives. Um, and so I work a lot on um, the agricultural policy in the UK. Right now I've been doing a huge campaign around our trade policy, trying to get amendments um, to the agriculture bill going through Parliament to stop the import of cheap food um, and trying to get agroecology into the agriculture bill and I'm on loads of different committees trying to change policy and I really enjoy it because it's just a bit by bit kind of process of saying you know we've got message and we've got stories and we've got passion we've got to transmit this into the wider political reality that is kind of we've all been kind of trying from the grassroots to change from the bottom up for so long you know, how can we actually take that, that passion we've got on the ground and, and inspire policymakers to think differently? And uh, I find it fascinating that things are really, you know, a lot of the times things don't really work. It, it, you know, the amendment that was debated in Parliament last week, um, we lost by 50 votes, you know, to stop the, um, you know, the um, uh, import of cheap food you know we were trying to get a ban on importing you know factory farm chicken and hormone beef and things like that but then again you know you can also look at it well you know we got 22 Tory rebels to vote for us which we didn't even expect for in the first place and they're going to start debating in the House of Lords and lots of people in the public are talking about it you know and and okay well maybe we lost that vote but we have opened people's minds to the possibility and we formed a great coalition between you know the big industrial farmers unions and the sign you know every major farming organization and every major environmental organization so you know signed a joint letter together to try and fight this together and i thought well that coalition is just as important as anything is you know as the fact that we didn't win that is that everybody's on the same track and and that's a positive thing so you've got to kind of think about the small wins of what you what you're doing as you go through that, and I, uh, you know, that, that that to me is the empowering thing that keeps me going, doing what I'm doing. Yeah, I mean, so so, so often in, in the sort of struggles we're involved in, although as you say, we might not have the particular victories we're working for at that time, the relationships that we build create yeah. a kind of, you know, a sort of a resilient kind of source for sort of future power as well, right? So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But so so I'm one of the things that really interests me, sort of personally, about your practice is is. In the community where I live, we, um, we we live on the land and we have gardens and there's capacity for like growing and cultivation and fields and that kind of stuff. But in our community, there's often a real split between people who do work on the land on a day-to-day -day basis and people who do more of the work I do, which is a bit more kind of, you know, socio-politically focused. Because it's so hard to kind of integrate that in a sort of day-to-day -day sort of level and it can often feel like a real tension within our community at some, certain times historically. There's been a tension, you know the poke in the office and the people out sort of getting their hands dirty and um, that can be hard to integrate but also just as an individual do you, do you find for yourself that you can sort of straddle those different spaces you know lobby, lobby lobbying members of parliament building kind of like international alliances and 
you know, you're running a farm as well, right? How, how do you, how does that all balance mm-hmm. out day to day for you? Well, I mean, I think different people have different personality types and their ability to juggle things. And I think I'm actually quite good at juggling things. And not everybody is. Some people need to be more focused, you know, with different things. And, you know, you'd have to acknowledge that different people have operate operate differently. Um, you know, and, and um, a lot of the people in the Land Workers Alliance, you know, um, all of our staff, um, everybody that works, um, you know, as on, you know, paid salaries in our organization also has to be a working farmer. And that's one of our policies um, because we don't want to sort of, kind of feed that split between the people you know you you won't keep our roots on the ground and I mean it is possible to try and split up your time so so you spend some time at a computer and some time outside working and that that can actually be really healthy balance I know there was a community I visited in France it was called Labore Noble um, based on the Gandhian philosophy Um, and they used to like have as part of their work regime that um, people would spend at least four hours doing something, con- you know, like writing or political activism work or, you know, some- something that was um, more desk based or intellectually based. Um, they didn't have computers there, so <laughs> it wasn't on a computer because <laughs> um, they're anti all that kind of technology. But um, and, and then uh, and then the other part of the day doing something physical. So it could be cooking or chopping wood or, um, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, they used to plow with horses and things like that. And I thought that was a really nice balance because it is quite good to be able to balance the mind stuff with the physical stuff. Um, and so if you can achieve that, that's brilliant. But it does take a little bit of planning and being careful to, like, set a few boundaries um, for, for what you're doing. And if you're not a person that operates like that, I think it's just about helping the people that are around you understand that people work in different ways and have different skill sets and they can all work together to achieve something very special that's the power of a social movement you know any social movement you have your fantastic artists or you might have your people are really good at singing songs or somebody really good at like going wow the politicians or somebody that's good at cooking the meals you know and you know, there's lies there's everybody's got a space in it you know and you just have to realize that blend is what makes it powerful so i mean one, one of the things i one of the things that i found interesting in your story is this um well, bringing together this kind of, you know, working of the land, sort of relocalization type ethics, this kind of stuff with the sort of more global or at least national level kind of political engagement. And often it can feel like there can be a bit of a, a critical attitude towards people going off and setting up their small holdings and, you know, it's a bit self-interested, it's kind of stepping, you know, it's kind of retreating in a way. Yeah. It seems that in your case, your re-engagement with the sort of the political level came through necessity, right? through just coming up against the yeah. the problems in the system that meant that you couldn't do what you wanted to do and yeah. I mean is it, is it that your political work is almost like a you know a, a necessity rather than part something that's sort of embedded in so in terms of the values of what you're doing or no, I think it no no I think it's about the values as well I mean you know, I, I mean it, it is a necessity that people fight for wider structural change I think in order to really like take care of all of humanity a little bit in what everyone does. You know, I feel to me that is actually a part of our moral, you know, our, our in, you know, our moral duty really is to, to think about everybody across the world um, while you're doing what you do. But, but the thing is, is that it, it actually brings a lot of power to what you do on a daily level. You know, for I, I, a lot of the farmers involved, is you might be a peasant farmer, you know, in, in Africa, you know, working in your fields, but you can have a mobile phone and you can like WhatsApp, you know, somebody in India that's saving their seeds, sending pictures of their different, <laughs> different color rice or, 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 you know, you, you know, you can be in, um, you know, your bender like about to get evicted from somewhere and you can like so- somehow communicate that to somebody that's getting evicted off of their land for a, a mega dam project, you know, and you've got some kind of common thread for what you're working towards. And it means you're working for something that's bigger than yourself. And I think that empowers you a lot. It gives you a wider sense of meaning for what you're doing in your life. Um, it, it, it's interesting, uh, you know, I mean, what I got most of this from the way I was raised with my mom, really. I mean, she was not a smallholder or a farmer or a food activist in any way, but she was um, totally blind um, and, um, you know, raised um, five of us children as a totally blind woman. And, and, and um, she realized that it was very difficult for blind people in America in the 1970s. Um, and um, 
I started, founded like a, um, a civil rights movement for blind people, trying to work for empowerment of blind people. And, you know, she, she kind of like started working with other blind people to try and fight for a better system for, for them and was in, very inspired by the civil rights movement of Martin Luther King in the South at the time. We grew up in Louisiana. And, um, you know, I, I watched her like kind of going around to these meetings, talking to different people saying, we need to come together. We need to fight for our disability rights. You know, we need to shut down the sheltered workshops that are you know, doing this. And, you know, kind of dragged us around as kids to the back of all these meetings and to these demonstrations and, and things like that. And, and, you know, I just realized like, you know, being blind was not her problem. It was the society's attitudes towards blind people. And she always said that. And she said, like, you know what, even if somebody gave me my sight back, I, I wouldn't take it back because it would have changed like what gave me meaning is being part of a movement that really fought for something that was better and bigger than yourself. And, you know, and, and I can really see now, you know, the ch tremendous changes in blindness legislation in America um, based on, you know, what their work as a social movement really started a long time ago. And you kind of think it's a long term picture. It's about building up those small things to something that will tremendously change society over time and, and like holding on to that. And it's, it's a very powerful thing to realize that you have the ability to change things if you organize and keep the faith and keep going with things. Brilliant. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah, when, when we spoke the other day, I was a bit like, wow, you know, you are, you're doing so much stuff. It's like, and all of them are tough, like, you know, parenting can be tough and, you know, yes. farming can be hard work. Mm -hmm. And then this political work that you're doing, it's like such an uphill struggle sometimes. I said, well, how do you keep going with that? You know, what gives you resilience? And you mentioned this sort of what you're saying now, but, you know, this bigger picture. You know, when we're doing something that's for some, something more than for ourselves, there's something that a bigger connection and the solidarity that, that really sort of sustains you, as you're, as you're saying. What do you do? How do you keep that bigger picture there? I mean, you know, it's, it, can be, it can be hard, right, to not end up <laughs> kind of for, for our awareness of the world to shrink down to, like, our, our petty <laughs> concerns and, like, shit, you know, this didn't happen, that didn't happen. How do you, how do you keep that more expansive kind of connection going? Is there anything particular? Well, I think once you're a part of a movement, I mean, you get endless WhatsApp, so <laughs> no, it's, it's hard to stay out. I'm like, come on, go away, <laughs> actually, sometimes. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, it's like, you know, once you get in, in, stuck in, you know, people just kind of pick up on what you're doing and you just, you, you just do it and then you realize, oh, there's that connection and there's that connection and this person's doing that. And, you know, you have to support each other. And I think, you know, as a, it, it is that solidarity thing. You realize that bigger picture is there, but you have to kind of, um, you have to balance it with being there for people when things aren't great and things go wrong as well, you know? So it, it's, it's about, um, developing a sense of family towards even not who's really close people who aren't just close to you, I guess. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to put it really. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm not really sure. Yeah. It's just, uh, that, I think know. it, I I think it comes across, right? The spirit of that comes across and the way you speak about it. And I mean, thank, thank you for taking the time to, to be with us. We, again, we'll come, we'll come back with some questions in a little while. Um, and just looking at the chat, it seems like it was, it was good that you took the time because there's a lot of people seeming quite inspired. So, yeah, nice. Honey, <laughs> I, for now. Oh, I like to go swimming and I like to eat loads of food. Um, <laughs> and I like tips. pets. <laughs> uh, great. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> little check, little checklist there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna bring uh, Everest in into the conversation uh, in a moment. Just before I do, um, I need to say uh, we'll talk to Everest for about 20 minutes, and then there's going to be these breakout groups. And in the breakout session, you can also just take a break. But if you want to opt into the breakout groups. What you're supposed to do, I think Chris Stepal already said this earlier, but we're reminding you, is use the, use the participant tab on Zoom. There's a little blue hand that gets raised up. Just click that, put your hand up, and then uh, Lindsay, who's going to be organizing those groups, will kind of see who wants to be in a group and who doesn't. Okay, So when we get there, you'll, you'll, you'll know about it. So in the meantime... Uh, I'm going to, uh, as I say, bring Everest into this. And Everest um, is a member of the ULEX team. Uh, Everest and I actually live together. We live in a community together. We work together. We're not in the same place today. You, I don't know when we see Everest if you see a very different kind of background. I'm away from home for a few days. But um, 
Everest is focusing, uh, does a lot of work, but, but on different areas. But one of the things that Everest is leading on is a, a psychosocial resilience uh, program for LGBTQI plus networks in Central and Eastern Europe. And Everest, if he was telling you, they were telling you this, would also say um, Western Balkans and post-Soviet countries. But it becomes a bit of a mouthful, right? So, and it's work that came out of uh, ULEX. We often do sort of strategic kind of thinking. We did a context analysis a couple of years ago. A couple of big issues that came to the surface where we wanted to put energy was one being climate justice movement and another being um, the sort of the rise of the far right, autocratic, authoritarian, nationalist, populist um, regimes in Eastern Europe. And so we started putting energy into that. And within that, uh, it's very clear that the LGBTQI networks and communities are really at the brunt of the kind of repressive systems there. There have been the the use of sort of demonizing people in those communities by the Law and Justice Party in their election program in October last year in Poland, in Hungary. Uh, just a week ago, there was a new law being passed, which makes it impossible to change your gender uh, in, on, in, in law um, and so on. So, you know, we, we kind of began focusing on that and Everest is, is taking a lead on that uh, and, and, and they're doing a great job of it as well. So I'm sort of wondering, Everest, can you, you tell us a bit about how you, how did you get into doing that kind of work? Sure, yeah, thank you, G. Um, and I just need to say that it's just also really inspiring to just listen to other speakers. And I think part of my journey into this kind of work was through inspiration of just like, yeah, seeing seeing other people doing really, really great job. Um, but before before the inspiration part came, uh, I think I, I mostly started with with a lot of disillusionment and like yeah losing losing hope so my my back, back background is um and like grassroots anarchist organizing um and this kind of organizing left me with a lot of feeling of luck and and yeah a lot of previous speakers were was were mentioning those things as well but it's like lack of lack of real deep connection and lack of prefiguration uh, that Anthea was talking about. Um, and I've, I've noticed myself like emotionally shutting down and experiencing loads of lack of hope. And I was just sick and tired of proving myself by doing and putting myself on the front line. And yeah, what, what Aisha and Dean said as well about like the quality of relating to each other. <laughs> really lacking that quality and really lacking questions around how do you relate to each other um and in the in the same time i was getting loads and loads of energy and motivation from from sense of belonging to a community um sense of joy and celebration so what what jotty was mentioning this this sense of like oh we are doing this thing together we are in it together um and i got like loads of inspiration as well as i've as I later on entered feminist movement and the emphasis of of community care um, and self preservation and things like that, that was really inspiring. And I started started seeing um, yeah things happening around me. So there was um, early stages of activist trauma support and people starting starting to talk about like oh actually this work that we are doing does have an emotional um, influence on us uh, and it does matter. Um, so, so yeah, so it was, it was just seeing, seeing those different movement groups emerging. I was getting really inspired by them. Um, I went on a sustaining resistance training in Nikodam, one of the, one of the very first ones. And that was a great inspiration for me as well. Also a possibility for me to explore my own, uh, lack of hope, my own process of burning out and, and losing motivation. Um, and then I, I've joined a, a trainers collective, um, a grassroots social, social movements trainers collective called SPINA, um, which uh, 
was and still is based in uh, in Poland. We are four people, uh, and we we started doing this this kind of work in Poland, looking at okay, so how how do we work as groups? How we relate to each other? Uh, what are our processes? How how are we doing in this pref prefiguration of our values? And also looking at the at the topic of burnout. Uh, losing hope losing members of our of our communities um and that was yeah that was quite a battle uh to be honest in the beginning to like even bring those topics into the awareness of, of social movements uh but it was, it was well well worth it and um yeah and then i also had a continuous relationship with ecodom and, and ulex project and here i am now uh, at the ulex project so, I mean, recently in, in, in developing the, the resilient, the LGBTQI plus resilience project, you've been doing quite a bit of um, sort of work on the ground, kind of talking to a lot of people, a lot of needs assessment type work as well. Uh, you're well connected into a lot of networks there yourself anyway. For people who, who maybe aren't, you know, don't have a very clear sense of what, what is going on, what what is the what are the experiences for LGBTQI plus folk uh, in in Central and Eastern Europe at the moment? What, what's that feeling like? Yeah. Mm. So you yeah so you mentioned the rise of uh, right and national populism and yeah all those all those discourses and different totalitarian regimes coming to to power in Hungary, Poland, and general tendency of, of the rise of the right across the whole region. Um, and when I was talking with, with different groups and organizations from the region, it was really striking to hear how, uh, how this experience is, is very similar for a lot of people, a lot of groups, a lot of movements. Um, and there are, I think there are different factors to it. So, um, one factor, factor is the broad, uh, similar socio-political situation across the whole region, um, which is which got to do with like historical factors, the shared experience of being part of a Soviet bloc, uh, which creates certain cultural, political um, tissues, certain way of building society, and obviously like. Uh, the countries in the region were undergoing the transition out of the Soviet bloc in many different ways, and the process doesn't look the same in, in the whole region, but there are really big similarities um, uh, coming from that. And then also the rise, is, the, the rise of, of far right and that tendency spreading across the, uh, across the region and how um, this tendency is really affecting the LGBTQI movement and how LGBTQI movement is becoming one of the main targets of the right of the rising far right movement, um, and also um, how the LGBTQI activism is different to the LGBTQI activism in Western Europe uh, because of those like different social political uh, contexts, but also low ca culture and. Um, so like to to just give some some examples like um there seems to be certain um certain narrative that the far right mo movement is using to attack the lgbtqi lgbtqi movements and communities um and they are talking about like um western gender ideology uh, and how like LGBTQI communities are threatening family values um, and like endangering um, yeah traditional traditional national values and things like that and those those kind of narratives used by the politicians are really really similar across the whole region uh, and and it's it's curious because like those those kind of narratives are quite in some places quite connected with um religious extremism and and catholicism but not uh, the the catholic church is not has not it's not so strong in in all of the countries or, uh, across the region so it's 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 quite curious that like it's kind of the same the, sa the same kind of narrative in in the region so so yeah there is there is like really a lot of trans and uh, transphobia, homophobia in the in the region. There is lack of social acceptance. 
Um, there's uh, when a lot of countries there's poor legislation legislation in terms of like protecting LGBTI community, or and there is also a poor level of uh, implementation of the anti-discriminatory laws. So there might be laws that are there in written, but like the level of implementation is uh, is not really working. Um, and I, yeah. So, so recently, I was I was speaking with one of the really big umbrella organizations working uh, in the Western Balkans. So they they did a survey across Western Balkans, and eighty two percent of LGBTQI uh, citizens that that uh, took part in that survey. Uh, consider that Serbia is not a good place to live as an LGBTQI person, uh, and this is yeah, this is one statistic from uh, from Serbia, uh, but it's really really similar across the the whole region. There is also very low trust in the government and politicians uh, among the LGBTQI com community. Uh, so these are all like statistics and, and political context, but also uh, it's got a very real effect on lives uh, of LGBTQI um, people, but also uh, specifically LGBTQI activists and the region. Um, so um, the LGBTQI community is already a vulnerable group that, uh, yeah, as I, as I mentioned, not, uh, not really protected by the laws under a lot of uh, stress attack and um yeah a, a lot of um very harsh narratives coming from from the society and then because of the socio-political situation people who are lgbtq activists uh, are experiencing a lot of uh, economical precarity and precarity in many ways so um ngos that work around LGBTQI issues, but also broader anti-discriminatory issues, uh, do not have access to funding because mm, in many countries the funding is not there for this kind of work uh, because of the of how the uh, the funding is being distributed by the government, uh, or many organisations are not um, are not deciding to apply for uh, for governmental money. Uh, because it just puts them on the spot and creates a great risk of repression, uh, and it might be um, it might be really uh, yeah covered sneaky kind of repression of like as soon as you receive governmental money you will you receive more um, more searches more desk checks uh, uh, the the authorities will question your uh, taxes your um, the way you keep your book, bookings and stuff like that, and that's a very yeah, that's that's a very particular part, kind of repression that like a lot of a lot of organisations are afraid of in the region. Um, so so, what what is it that the that the program that you're you're developing and 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 running? What you hope? What kind of learning is there in that? And what are you what you hope? How how are you hoping it will help? organizations and people and the movement to build resilience there yeah so so that there, there are different levels to it as well um, I think the main the main thing uh, that I'm really passionate about is actually be building a movement uh, that will be a strong movement across that region um, because what I um, what I'm really, I was really inspired about what Jyoti was was talking about because of what I believe in that like this kind of powers, this kind of repression is really seeking out to alienate alienate us, so alienate LGBTQI community from from wider community, but also to alienate. LGBTQI uh, activists, LGBTQI community members from each other, and what what we need to do, and like the the biggest act of of fighting against that power uh, is to is to come together and reach out to to each other so so the elements of the program will um, will enable people to come come together and share uh, knowledge uh, from from different types of organ organizing but also from different types of um, 
security strategies, resilience strategies that different organizations and movement are, are implementing across the region. Um, we go, it, uh, the program will also explore the topic of security and, and risk management. So it's quite crucial in this situation um, that movements, organizations are being prepared for the level of oppression uh, and uh, identifying uh, elements of hostile environments, identifying the, the levels of risk and, and possible strategies to, um, to answer um, and adapt to those risks is really, really crucial for the longevity of the movement. Uh, and then also we will, we will talk about burnout and burnout prevention. So earlier when I was talking about the trainers collective in, in, that we set up in Poland, Spina, what we, what we saw back then in Poland is that the level of um, burnout across the movements was, was really, really big. Uh, but the um, the knowledge about what burnout actually is was really, really small. And that's what's still happening in a lot of uh, um, places in Eastern Europe, Western Balkans, across the movement. And that's that's something that a lot of organizations were talking to me that, yeah, we, we this is a huge problem, but we never talk about it. Uh, so so the idea is to just actually bring that that topic on the table and see how, okay, so so it's there, what what do we need to do about it? Um and also, and also, yeah, just relationship building. So um, being able to bring people together uh, so that they share their experiences, share share their struggles, and like similar how what what Jyoti said that that's something that gives us strength. That's something that that make us feel oh, there is this there is this bigger picture. Uh, there is a lot of us actually, and we come up against against similar obstacles and we can uh, we can work together to to overcome them thanks everest i mean i know that you you personally you've put quite a lot of time as well into developing skills and understanding around uh working somatically with trauma and this kind of this kind of approach as well is that is that something that that you you will bring into the program also yeah, definitely, definitely. I'm gonna on part of the programs. I'm gonna work with another trainer who's also uh, really into somatic uh, methodologies. And um, yeah, again, that's that's something that's not really well explored uh, across the movements. And for me personally, that's that's a really strong source of my own resilience, my own connection to my body. And as a trans person. For me, that was a really huge journey to be able to reclaim that connection and to be in connection with my own body. And that's why it's so, so powerful. So in the context of working with the LGBTQI movement, when it is our bodies that we are fighting for, for yeah, in, in many cases, this work seems to be really, really crucial. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Everest. Thank you. So, so we're gonna we're actually gonna go into uh, this break now, a twenty minute break. So, um, we've got a few questions here that came up, and uh, I'm gonna I'll ask them to to uh, each of you individually but I mean it, you can all kind of chip in to these if they if they sort of resonate uh, for you and the first question I was going to um, put to you Anthea I mean, it's been it seems like a, an age ago since <laughs> from you <laughs> so this is first one and it's it relates to a theme of activist identity and the sense that within within the term activist there are quite different kind of cons constituencies. There are people who are activists in the sense of maybe they're kind of professionals working with NGOs. Um, sometimes they kind of like could be seen as like activists by choice. You know, we sort of have a have a, a calling and go and do that. But then there are other people who maybe not call themselves activists, but they're very much doing activist work, maybe grassroots, community-based kind of organizing where activism grows out of the kind of the necessity 
of everyday life. And there can be tensions between these different kinds of identities within activism. Is that you sort of say something, tell us something about that and your experience of navigating some of those so differences? Yeah, so I had an interesting experience when I um, first started um, asking people questions about what the, you know, what what do you think the inner life of activism, you know, what's going on in the inner life of activism? Does that mean anything to you? What, what do you think's missing, if anything? Um, because there were, there were broadly two different types of answers. Um, and of course, there was variation between them. And, and one was when I spoke to people who'd been doing a similar kind of activism to me, which is essentially choosing to do it um, because um, for whatever reason you're not having to fight for the very conditions of your existence um, you know the dailiness of that struggle um, but you're choosing to do to do this um, and all the people I spoke to about that from, from that perspective said well yes yes you're right definitely something's missing and they saw it in very similar terms to how I saw it um, and then when I spoke to people who, for what, in whatever way, um, had been uh, fighting for their lives effectively, um, or at least with lived experience of what it was, they said, well, yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. Of course, something's missing. Um, of course, we need to look at this. But, but hold on, this isn't new. We've always known this. That's the very basis of the kind of activism we're doing. We have to do that work ourselves in order to get to the point where we can do activism. Of course we know this, like that is that is half the problem. We can see it. Um, and it's that people who are on the, on the outside of the conditions of privilege for whatever that particular issue is, of course can see the problems with the dominant system much more clearly than those who are caught up in the privilege of acting within it. Um, and, and this comes right down to you know, the tension that can be at the heart of a lot of activist difficulties um, and the saviour stuff that, that can go on. So I think our, our understanding of, of the inner work um, and what it is can be really um, quite cloudy and quite blocked by various forms of privilege. And, and that's certainly uh, an understanding that I came to through going into this inquiry. Um, I kind of thought I got it. I thought I understood um, the nature of my privilege and and what it had got me into and, and, this, and what therefore I was bringing to my activism. But actually there were things that I hadn't understood. I hadn't understood the depth of how, um, where, where any of us come from conditions, how we know things um, and the situations that we can then get into in activism. And, and I think quite a lot of I, I talk at the end of what I'm writing about about what we might need to reclaim and what we might, might need to relinquish. And I think this work is so much better thought through on by people who have got lived experience of what they're working on, uh, which is not to say, of course, that, you know, like everyone's got work to do up to a point. But I think people who are living it have had to do some of that work. And I think people who are choosing to come in and and put their weight behind a struggle um, might have more to relinquish than they realise when, when they get into this. Thanks. And and there's I mean there's a related question uh, for for Jyoti, which relates to I mean the way that uh, the way I'm interpreting the question is some of those differences show up um, really clearly in the kind of glo the kind of global movement. And that you're involved in, you know, sort of land rights and and different different kinds of ways of organising, different kinds of experience. Um, how, how do you work with that kind of diversity within the the global movement, the the sort of via campesina type um, work that you're doing? How do you work with the diversity of of, of constituencies that make that up? Uh, yeah, that's actually really. I mean, it's it's hard work sometimes. Um, and we spend an awful lot of time doing very boring, you know, long meetings where you have to um, have translation for everything because translation's core to the work because, you know, so many of the peasant farming communities, indigenous communities around the world, I mean, the multiplicity of languages is just 
unbelievable and you know and and it would really marginalize voices unless we do that so you know every every meeting has to whole, have to have a whole layer of translators involved and speaking orders and you know man women and youth being um <laughs> if you've ever been inv involved in any meetings you know where you have to do consensus decision making imagine yeah we're 200 million members trying to get dissent consensus decisions it's a bit it's a bit mad at the gatherings <laughs> and the meetings go on for like 18 hours <laughs> and we have a saying it's not another world is possible it's another meeting is possible <laughs> and everybody's like oh my god another one so it's quite funny but you can always look forward to everybody like having a good sing-along or something at, you know at the end of the end of the evening or early wee hours of the morning you know <laughs> but um I, yeah there's definitely stuff that comes up i mean you know i mean for example even our you know some of the some of the core values they're very much shared but there's like parts of it where people's in you know things might really diverge from their life interest you know their life experience you know you may have a group that's really had to fight through violent means to get, get keep access to their territory had to use whether it's bows and arrows or guns or you know whatever form of violence in order to defend their territories because they're actually under physical threat of losing their their land or or their communities being you know uh, you know troops visiting their communities and things like that and others where you know they're, they're very committed to non-violence for example so that would need to be debated out with a lot of debate at these meetings and if it's a, an area where people listen to all sides of it and we can't come to a consensus that doesn't go into the central statement or the principles of the organization we don't take a stand on violence or no violence for example or um some of the language you know we have a lot of um you know groups that are very marxist and um communist kind of leaning in in south america for example with movimiento Terra and some of the you know real leftist groups and then and then we represent the peasant farming organizations in eastern europe who had who suffered tremendously under communism um with extermination of the peasant way of life and you know, often having to hide their animals and seeds and things to, to, to defend what they're doing. So we have to really think about that language very carefully and, and be like, well, we're, we're about peasant farming um, and about basic human rights, but it's not necessarily left or, you know, communist or not, you know, et cetera. So there are those tensions and, and we have to take time to, to handle them well. And, it, you know, it doesn't mean that people don't often have a lot of arguments, um, but, you, you know, you have to find a way to, to come to a common vision because you can't move forward without a common vision. So, so just to say, I mean, if, if any of you, Anthea, Aristide and Aisha want to sort of chip in with these around these questions, then please do. Um, if you don't, then I'm just going to keep, keep going through through a few different sort of points. But if there's something you want to follow up in, just jump in, right? Um, so there's a question here, which is for um, Aisha and Dean. So I'm going to read it to you because it's, it's longish. So it says, has the concept of self-care being co-opted by a capitalist agenda in the same way that mindfulness has? And do mindfulness practitioners have an ethical responsibility to not provide stress management tools which ensure people function better in a deeply unwell society? <laughs> Either of those questions could go up, take us into a lot of different directions, couldn't they? But yeah, Aisha, Dean, you got uh, thoughts on that? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, it's, it's a big, big question. Um, you know, and, and, and often we get this debate whether ethics and morality um, should be taught alongside mindfulness. And particularly in the medicalized forms of mindfulness, it's, it's often, you know, uh, perceived, uh, certainly in the conversations I've had, as, as not being necessary, you know, um, which is a, an interesting debate. But I think I, 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 I tied into what's just been said by, you know, um, the two speakers there. And, and I think whatever we're doing needs to radiate from all directions. So everybody, you know, is partially right. We really teach from that space of everybody has a, a you know, a, a space and they're partially right. And really coming from a space of how can I, you know, it, 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 it's like love and kindness. It radiates from all directions, so all of us can be useful. And at the base of that is intention and motivation. 
That's what I would say. Intent. When we really look at our intention, it doesn't. For me, it doesn't really matter um, what the moral, ethical code is. If the intention and the motivation is right, whether we had a lived experience or whether we're coming into this as a choice, if we focus on our intention and our motivation at the baseline, and whatever that is for us individually, it, it, that's okay. You know, if we have a collective intention, motivation, then great. That's what I would say. Um, but fundamentally, I would agree. You know, a lot of mindfulness, certainly of, of today, it, it has kind of been taken over. There is a capitalist agenda, and we can't deny it. It's there. And I, I think it's really important that, you know, mindfulness is, is it's seen for what, what it can be. And that's what our agency is when we go into practice, like Dean mentioned there, that our intention and motivation is key. If we don't have an intention and motivation, it can mean anything. So, you know, when we're looking at um, managing stress, I think it's more about recognising when we get stressed so that we can take care of ourselves. And it's about having a balance. We need a balance. There's, with mindfulness, there's a sense of life-centred as well as self-centered we're trying to get the balance right knowing that we're connected if we kind of step out of that and we're just kind of coming into this bubble where we practice mindfulness because things are so tough we're not really connected with the real world but when we can turn to our experience with a real sense of ah this is here i need to honor this experience you know that the our emotions that we're, we're feeling society things that happen around us when we're socially engaged we have to be able to turn to it you know, mindfulness is about, for me, it's about getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, not about creating, a, 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 you know, feeding into one, a, this system that's already here that actually is strangling people. It's, it's, you know, it's really isolating people. If we can practice in a way that we are deeply connected to our own selves, really get a sense of our own emotions so that we can be with others, so that we can be a part of society. So that we're there to, you know, look at the difficulties as well as the joys, celebrate the good stuff, question the stuff that, that comes up for us in a way that is that we're really aware that we can grow, that we can learn, that we can teach, that we can share. Not coming from this self-centered, only me, I need to do better, I need to be better to fit, fit in. It's, a, you know, the full spectrum. Everything exists and we're part of it. How are we in that context? So it's all about seeing the context in which we're in and applying ourselves and being with accordingly. Yeah, that would be my, my response to that. I love that question. Great question. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So, so it relates a bit to this question that's going, it's, um, for Everest, which is, um, you know, it, it says, uh, you know, there's a lot of focus around self-care, but what, what's the relationship of self-care to collective care? Hmm. So what's the relationship with self-care to collective care, Everest? Really good question. Um, and I think when I when I think about it, I tend to try to try not to separate those two. And when I think about it, um, taking care of myself is also taking care of my own community. So taking care of the resources I can bring into community is taking care of the whole, is taking care that the community stays resources, that the uh, community can use my knowledge, can can use my skills, that I can contribute. And on the other hand, if we if we take care of the community well, and if we build uh, groups and structures that, uh, um, that really think about it and really think about how can individuals thrive uh, in those groups and in those structures, uh, we we do self care. We do individual care for uh, for each person. So so in my yeah in my in my thinking about it, those two are really are really interlinked uh, and in a way can't be can't be separated. And obviously there are like different ways we different ways we address those two things. There are different ways we address uh, self care. Different ways we address uh, community care or, or, or movement care or organizational care and we, we would use different tools but some of the tools can be can be same tools like coming coming together to to watch a movie or uh, I don't know do something silly and not only coming together to 
to protest or to uh, write a new law proposal or like or, or any other kind of like work on activism but also just spending time together is a way of like oh i'm taking care of myself i'm having a really great time and also i'm taking care of our community and taking care of our relationships i'm nourishing myself and nourishing my group um so yeah i see i see a lot of relational uh thanks so so we've got um five minutes before we pass over to uh ruby and christabel to kind of sign off i thought it might be just nice to kind of go around and hear a last kind of comments from from each of you you know not wanting to put you on the spot too much so i thought maybe we could just go in the order of like anthea then jyoti uh, dean Aisha Everest, just for kind of last comments, reflections that have come up, just, you know, up, up to about a minute each, so not long, yeah. Does that sound okay? Well, if not, just say, I have nothing to say, right? So, um, Anthea, sort of signing off type comments, anything you want to want to add or, or share with us that you don't, don't think we've got to or that seems interesting? You're muted, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. I wanted to say um, how, how good it is to hear from the other panellists the, these practical um, instances um, of what I've been hearing people talk about. I've, I've been having these wonderful conversations um, for two years now um, and trying to be the spider kind of weaving um, something into something that might make sense and might be helpful um, to other people. Um, and there's a slight bit of solipsism there. I suppose I'm trying to write the book I wish I'd found about five or 10 years ago. Um, but it, it, these conversations just get deeper. And each time um, I'm in conversation with people talking about their work, something goes click and drops deeper um, and the web feels like it strengthens. So I just wanted to say thanks very much to all of you. Brilliant. Thank you. And and Jyoti, some some sort of closing closing comments from you. Uh, yeah. Um <laughs> yeah, I'm not really sure. I guess if I was gonna write a book, Anthea, then <laughs> it would have been um or it would be and I'm not going to write a book. I don't have time to write a book, but <laughs> uh, it would be about like how just different people are very different and different personality types are super important. Um and that you just have to take a lot everybody that you work with. Um, for who they are and and, the, and and that they operate really differently. You know, some people really like to focus on something and get it all done really perfectly and might feel a bit down about everything sometimes, but you can try and cheer them up and other people will be running around networking and other people will be doing these other things. And if you can kind of really hold the people you're with and accept them for who they are and where they're at and work with them, then that's the most beautiful thing that you can do to kind of keep, keep our movements alive. And yeah, yeah it would be to think, for people to think about that a bit more and how to get past this conflict resolution sort of stuff by understanding that everybody's different and how we can help each other be different but work together um yeah and just keep doing what everybody's doing you know we're all brilliant <laughs> nice okay and uh aisha dean and each of you some some last sort of signing off words for us We never know who should go first. <laughs> There's a joke in mindfulness. You have loads of people at the doorway. No one knows who to go in first. No one wants to go first. So everyone just kind of stands there and it's like, uh, who, who, what do we do? <laughs> go for it. <laughs> um, well, I think the, the message that I'd like to share just to finish is that, you know, there's more than two sides to a coin. You know, that edge, staying on that edge is really, really useful. So there's more than two sides to a coin is what I would say. Um, and, you know, just, just because this is about resilience and so forth, the other thing I would just say is that, um, you know, <clears throat> rather than self-care, maybe resourcing ourselves is also useful. Resource, you know, it, self-care can feel a bit pamperish. So maybe reframing that to resourcing ourselves so we can do the work, carry out our intentions and motivation. Yeah. Yeah. 
um, words from Anthea and Joyce. There's, it is about collaboration. It is about um, coming together, hearing different diverse voices. That's how we become empowered. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. Uh, our strap line, for instance, at the Urban Mindfulness Foundation is embracing our differences and connecting to common humanity. And that means really being interested. It means asking questions and it means being curious and, and, and staying in that space. There's, there's research that's been done that shows that you can't be traumatized and curious at the same time. Our brains can't manage it. Our bodies can't manage it. So we, step, we tend to work with our, um, our nervous system. We calm down. We look, we're curious in a kind way. That can be really, really empowering and really connecting. So, yeah, I think being curious, being connected is a radical act of love. That's what this is all about. Thank you. So, so Everest, no, no pressure, mate, but like, you know, final words of wisdom were with you. So give it to <laughs> us. <Yeah. laughs> really no pressure. Thank you, G. Um, yeah, it's 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 quite hard to add anything brilliant to it because all what was said is really brilliant. And I guess, yeah, what I'm what I'm taking away is, is this sense of connection and this sense of like, oh, uh, there are like a lot more people out there who are doing this kind of work, and we can all share experiences and we can all come together and like, yeah, on events like that or any other events or just like. In our in our minds, bringing each other to our hearts and minds, and being like, it's all right. There are way loads of people out there, and I'm not alone. And uh, yeah, this sense of like collective collective power and um, and knowing knowing that yeah, there are there are people, there are movements. There is I do have all that at my back supporting me at all times is just just feels great good 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 so so like massive really massive thanks to to Ampir and dean and aisha and jyoti and everest inspiring and you know just really 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 interesting so thank you all for that time and i'm going to pass over to um ruby and christabel to kind of finish off now sort of clo close the session and the and the you know the whole sort of four week series as well ruby and christabel are the kind of organizational powerhouse behind making this whole thing happen so good to good to hear from them in in closing so yeah thanks everybody and, and over to you again no pressure thanks to you <laughs> Um, no, I just want to say thank you um, to G, to Anthea, Isha, Dean, Jyoti and Everest for such an insightful and um, grounded exploration of resilience. I find that the word resilience and the conversations around it can often feel um, quite jargonistic um, and like I have an attachment to the words but I don't really know what they mean and it just felt very um, clear and, and um, experienced in, in everything that you were saying. So thank you all for that. Um, and just um, similar to what you were saying, Everest, I think for me, the way I feel resourced is by being in these sorts of gatherings and kind of um, hearing the stories of people and, and the way that they're working um, to build community, to look deeply within it, like our, our deeply entrenched patterns um, and seeing how we can start to replace those who practice. Um, it can be very easy to really focus on all the things that seem to be going in the wrong direction and to not remember how many things are going in the right direction. Um, and so, you know, for everyone who's tuning in and, and perhaps hasn't spoken um, th throughout the series, just knowing that you're there tuning in to listen to these conversations, that you care about these conversations, um, that to me, it helps to build resilience um, and, and to feel resourced and, and, and empowered to keep going. So yeah, real deep thanks for that. Um, I want to thank Jyoti for reminding us of cultivating that sense of family um, that we're working in and, and, and for something greater than ourselves. Um, that's, you put that so beautifully. Um, and that also we're plugged into this long-term movement. This is something that's come up each year at Regenerative Activism, um, which first came up with ASAD and it kind of blew my mind. And, and this is knowing that it's not a linear struggle. It's not, you need to get 
you know this one policy through and then everything's going to be fine actually no it's 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 a movement that has been happening forever and and we're just kind of hopping on the train at one point of it if that makes mm -hmm any sense um, and thank you to uh, Anthea for exploring um, how the inner and the outer come together um, and for all your work that you're putting into listening to people's stories and finding out more about that um, I'm really excited to see your book um, to Dean and Isha for their beautiful articulation of mindfulness and um, and I, I love how you put that mindfulness is a practice of, of becoming aware of our relationships and how we're relating to ourselves, to each other, to the context around us. Um, it's very disempowering when you think that it's you who's got a problem or something that's got a problem and actually the way that we perceive that. And that's something that comes through training and practice. Um, um, yeah, and, and about, you know, practices not being a means of just passively accepting what we've been given, um, but using that acceptance as a means to not become so attached to the fruits of our actions, but to stay um, resourced and rooted whilst we confront those things that we have now hopefully seen a bit clearer. Um, and to Everest for articulating the relationship between self-care and, and community care and, and just the power of community and communal spaces to again share stories and experiences and knowledge and tools and wisdom um, in the face of burnout and alienation and repression and the rise of the far right um, and it just really reminds me of how different activism is in, depending on the context that you find yourself in. Um, so thank you all. Um, I mean, there's so much, but I better not continue. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you. And and yeah, again, thanks to each person who's tuned in um, and coming on this journey of regenerative activism and exploring these themes. Um, hope you will tune in again, hopefully next year, if we do it again. Um, remember that these recordings will be public in a couple of weeks. So if you found it helpful, then please do share um, with anyone else that you might think will find them helpful <laughs> and uh, please sign up to the ULEX mailing list I think that's just been put in the chat yeah Ruby's put that in there um, and take a look at all their upcoming trainings um, and events um, and just loads of incredible resources and knowledge there um, what else was there oh uh, advise got some things coming up um, which we will announce soon that one of those is a storytelling and mythology um, series where we're kind of looking at the stories that we tell ourselves um, cultural narratives and um, inner narratives and ancient mythology as well um, taking a look at that and also going to be launching a kind of year-long course as well um, I think that's everyone um, again thank you to Ulex and to Gita Paraha for creating this um, but yeah, the co-creation of this. Um, and I think that's everything. Yeah, so we are looking into um, setting up an unofficial sort of Facebook group because I've seen a few comments from people about staying in touch and having a place to say. So it's not going to be a sort of official site from any of the organisations, but we're going to perhaps trial sort of setting up a space and see what interest there is and how that, how that works as a potential way of staying connected. And we'll also share all the resources that have been kind of coming up throughout um, this evening, but also from the past series as well. Um, so the past events. Um, so we'll put them together in one place for you.